Okay, uh, good afternoon uh, to everybody. My name is Antonio Colombo from uh, Milano, uh, Italy, and it is my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, this uh, symposium uh, sponsored by Med Alliance uh, regarding uh, modern usage of uh, drug coated balloon. Um, I'm not going to spend time to go over the objective because I think the objective was to learn how to use uh, these devices uh, uh, besides instant restenosis. Uh, I encourage people uh, uh, to ask a question, to send a question. Uh, they will be uh, recorded uh, and uh, we try to answer most of them. Uh, Dr. Kambis Mayaseki is going to be the first uh, speaker and is going to illustrate uh, uh, the characteristic of this uh, specific uh, sirolimus uh, eluting uh, drug coated balloon. So, thank you very much, Antonio. So, we just go through okay. um, uh, the most important thing to that you get better get an understanding about uh, what we're talking today. So, those are the conflict of interests. So. There's quite a progress in coronary vascularization over years, starting by bypass craft 60 years ago, now ending up uh, with second uh, generation of drug eluting stent. And um, then the first generation of drug eluting balloon came up. Uh, you know the story of the BVS as well. Uh, at the moment, uh, we don't have a good guideline recommendation for that. Um, and uh, now we're focusing more and more on a second generation of drug eluting balloon um, with uh, special... Um, sustained limnus release. So the point is here that uh, we still have, if you look at this landmark analysis, uh, it's a meta-analysis of 19 trials, that we still have a high event rate once we deal with stents. Means uh, more than 2% per year target vessel failure, uh, no matter which stent you implant. And still, if you look at long-term outcomes, which means 10 years here, you see that there is a really high event rate, 3.3% event rate every year. And um, this is uh, also a cumulative, event, a cumulative as, um, incidence of the primary endpoint, which is uh, maize target uh, vessel failure and um, death MI. So um, you see up to 10 years, still 43%, no matter which drug you use. Well, there is a new paradigm for metal-free PCI, and we are concentrating more and more on that, especially if we have long disease and diffused lesions, uh, um, as we see it more and more often, also in diabetic patient, patient with chronic, uh, chronic total occlusion as well. And the idea behind this is that we preserve atherotic physiology. We allow uh, a, position, a positive remodeling of the vessel. And we are uh, sure we try to avoid metallic uh, scaffold complication. And we have short adapt and uh, we keep up opportunities for the future procedures as well. So now uh, to the product of the session, the so solution SLR. So the special thing here is that you have micro reservoirs and um, and uh, there is a sustained therapeutic effect for up to 90 days, which is uh, quite interesting. And then you have a proprietary micro reservoir technology and a cell arterial technology. And uh, just uh, look at the video here that you better understand how the product is built up, this new drug eluting balloon. And um, yeah, here you can see the micro reservoirs as well and then the drug is delivered um, through the vessel wall, as you can see here. So I will go a little bit into the details uh, of, um, of uh, the restenosis cascade. As you know, the first, what we want to avoid is uh, acute thrombosis and uh, then inflammation. And then there is a period where we have the smooth muscle cell proliferation. And uh, when you look here at this green bar, what you see is that the solution, SLR, still gives the drug to the vessel uh, in a sustained 
uh, release over 90 days. And this is quite important compared to other products, right? It's behaving actually like a uh, drug-eluting stent uh, with abdominal uh, stent generation compared to other drug-coated uh, balloons. <coughs> and another interesting thing is that uh, there is uh, quite... Um, even uh, as we know from all those drug looting balloons in the past, that we have a loss of drug during the procedure. And this is a benchmark test from MetaLines itself. Uh, was done from peripheral balloons. And what you can see here is that the loss during the procedure is quite high in the other, other uh, um, balloons, up to 80%, and compared to the solution with 36%. It's quite interesting. So nevertheless, uh, we have to improve uh, superiority uh, uh, also regarding endpoints. And this is why the solution de novo study started. It's a big randomized trial, uh, over 3,300 uh, patients. And uh, it's a trial where drug eluting balloon uh, versus drug eluting stent are compared regarding the it's a strategy trial. And it's still uh, already enrolling. As you can see here, the primary endpoint is target vessel failure based on non-inferiority at one year and superiority at five years. And um, there's a one-to-one -one randomization and, um, and you can see all the B strategy, all the E strategy. Nevertheless, there's a, around 30% a uh, allowed to go crossover once you do a balloon-based strategy and might end up in dissection or uh, um, let's say slow flow or something like that, huge dissections or limited flow, then you might be allowed as well to cross over. At the moment, what I heard is that there might be around 15% crossover in the study, but it's uh, not official data yet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, we have uh, uh, four minutes for uh, uh, discussion, so if uh, any question from the panelists, from the audience. So may I ask, uh, Campus, you know this uh, drug-coated balloon, obviously, so how is it different uh, from other products available on the market in terms of drug uh, release and, uh, and how is that pharmacokinetically helpful for preventing the stenosis? Well, um, You've seen the slides, right? Um, yeah. There is a sustained release uh, up to 90 days, which is very important to avoid instant restenosis. And uh, another thing is that we didn't focus on is that the particles are very, very small. What we've seen is, especially also in other trials or other, other balloons, that there might be some flow limitation based on uh, very big particles uh, with microembolization. We don't quite, uh, we don't see that so often. So might be a superiority as well uh, regarding the new design of the balloon. So may, may I ask one question for the panelists? Uh, uh, I would like to ask your opinion about the uh, using of the drug coated balloon in the vein grafts. In stenosis. Probably is it possible you... or is it uh, promising or just? But, no, I Personally, I, I only used, uh, in my experience, a drug-coated balloon uh, when I had instant restenosis located in a vein graft. Um, usually, um, to tell you the truth, in the last three years, I treated maybe two or three vein grafts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true that most of the time we go for the native vessels because Agreed. of the risk of embolization, I suppose. But who but, knows, maybe it's also a promising uh, uh, way to treat the vein grafts. No, but uh, I think uh, uh, to seriously answer your question, I, I, have no, I have no data to answer your question in a reliable fashion. Maybe I can comment on the vein graft. I think there's a role for distal anastomosis because there's a lot of uh, size mismatch with your vein graft and your native vessel. So I think, you know, uh, drug coated balloon is maybe a good therapeutic option for the distal anastomosis. It's uh, a drug lost on the coated balloon during the transit. Uh, have you any comparison with the other products like Sequent Please or Magic Touch? 
Well, that what I what what we know actually now from from the company standpoint is uh, that uh, there are only two these two uh, these uh, two um, other balloons tested, right, on the bench. Um, so I don't have information from other data. Yeah, I was just coming back on the question about vein graft intervention. Uh, we've got an enormous database of uh, DCB work, and our conclusion is that um, for de novo vein graft work, DCBs come out with a MACE rate that's very similar to drug eluting stents. And actually, the answer is we shouldn't really be doing angioplasty in vein grafts. We should be fixing the natives exactly. generally. Okay. Yeah. I think that most people would still try to do that, wouldn't they, even if it's a CTA? Yeah. Okay. So if uh, there are no other, in, uh, I'm sure the question will come along the presentation of the cases. There will be a, a series of case presentations, and the first presenter is uh, uh, Dr. Ha Hi Wa, who is uh, uh, going to discuss a case of, uh, I hope, diffuse disease or long lesions. Okay. Thank you very much for your introduction, uh, Dr. Colombo. So my name is uh, Hi Hua Ho from uh, Singapore, and I've been tasked to share a case on a patient with uh, long diffuse disease and why you should think before you stand. Uh, these are my disclosures. So the patient is a male, uh, 63 years old, ex-smoker with multiple cardiovascular risk factors. So he had a prior PCI to LED back in 2015 with two long drug eluding stands. Uh, so he had long-standing uh, diabetes mellitus on uh, requiring insulin for control, and he presented to our hospital with uh, NSTEMI uh, in January 2022. So from the ECG, you can see that it is, uh, there's no acute ischemic change, so we can't really tell which is the culprit artery. So if you look on the picture on the left, uh, you can see that he has a severe stenosis in the mid to distal left circumflex, but this is a rather small vessel. And the stand is widely patent uh, in the LAD. We come to the right, uh, a little bit of plug, uh, minor plug in the proximal RCA. And you can see that he has quite a large uh, RPL and RPDA, a severe critical stenosis in the proximal segment and the middle segment of the RPDA. From the RAO uh, shot, you can see, you can appreciate how long the uh, RPDA is. So looking back at the old angiogram, uh, comparing, uh, you can clearly see that uh, the RPDA has uh, progressed significantly. So we thought that the culprit artery would be the RPDA, and this should be our um, target vessel for PCI. So the question that we would like to ask ourselves is, uh, how should you treat a patient with long diffuse disease with underlying uh, diabetes? So maybe I can uh, open the for discussion. So probably we ask our our ladies in the panel uh, how they would treat. Yeah, so we have a rather young patient, 60 years old, um, diabetic, and uh, distal uh, vessel. We don't want to implant too much metal in small vessels. We know that these patients are prone to restenosis, and I think this would be a very uh, nice lesion um, for DCB to try to uh, uh, leave the vessel at disease without any metal to avoid uh, stent-related uh, complication afterwards, to allow the vessel to, uh, to remodel, to uh, retain its, its uh, vascular function as a motion. And uh, so I think this would be uh, the ideal candidate uh, for DCB and short testing. But, um, you know, in, uh, in real life, uh, I mean, we are DCB aficionados here, but uh, in, uh, in the real world, I would say the large majority of, uh, of interventionists will have no fear to implant a 2, 5, uh, 38 millimeters DS in this vessel. <laughs> well, the problem is what you do later because uh, no, you know, no, but, uh, keeping you, it open. You is don't have issue. to convince me, you have to convince. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but this will be the standard approach. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in, uh, in many labs, when I walk in, uh, I see uh, 38, uh, 225 uh, DS, yeah. and I get perplexed. Yeah. I mean, uh, to begin with, this is not a 38 millimeter lesion. I think in diabetic, you still need to spot stand uh, and avoid. Uh, 
full metal jackets um, uh, because indeed you end up with a high risk of instant restenosis. And as you rightly pointed out, this is a young patient uh, who will probably come back in the future. So preserving the distal targets, uh, whatever they may be for the surgeon uh, in the future is also uh, not unimportant. Yeah, there is one Point. question. As we can see, we had actually good result on LAD seven years after previous PCI. So why not to put standard? Yeah, yeah, this is a, this is a very uh, important remark. It's not, uh, it's not easy to give you a contradictory statement. Well, uh. So and maybe those stents were not implanted uh, with state of the art. If you implant these stents with uh, IVUS and OCT, who knows? But that's the reason why we need data. I mean, it's nice uh, uh, to be enthusiastic, but uh, we know that uh, science is not always pleasing the enthusiastic people. There's so, another question so in the back of the mind. I'm just, uh, my, I would like to uh, say my opinion. Maybe it's a comment. Uh, first of all, we... Uh, May, uh, we need to uh, overcome from the anatomy of the right coronary artery. So the PDA branch is uh, maybe 2.5 and the, the distal part anti up to the bifurcation is uh, more than 3.540. So if we will do anyway the crossover stenting because this osteo lesion, <coughs> so we can make uh, some malposition because 2.5 uh, dilating up to the uh, 4.0, it's maybe um, impossible, but the the one chance just to make a DCB in this point. Okay, I think we need uh, to continue. Uh, let's see what you did. Okay, okay. thank you very much for the comments. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna show you uh, how did I treat. So I think if we opt for stenting, I think we're gonna be stent very long, perhaps gonna be 60 mm or more. So I think the study from Korea have shown that if you put in long stents, uh, it is associated with uh, TRR as well as increased risk of cardiac death and stent thrombosis. So my uh, option at that time, or my, my choice was to use a drug-coated balloon. As we have heard, uh, it has several advantages. You treat the disease segment uh, and you with local drug delivery and you leave no permanent metallic frame. And the fact that you have no stent, there's no risk of stent thrombosis. And there's always this uh, potential for positive vessel remodeling. So with DCP, I think the important thing is to do an optimal lesion preparation. So you need to pre-dilate the balloon, pre-dilate the lesion with a semi-compliant balloon. You can use a specialized balloon like the scoring balloon. For very calcified lesions, you can consider a rotoblation or lithotripsy. And if you get a good angiographic result, residual stenosis 30% or less with non-flow limiting dissection, then you can finish your procedure with drug-coated balloon. So I, I wired with a Sean Black guide wire and use a 1515 to predilate the proximal segment followed by a 20. And you can see that uh, still not very good. This uh, proximal segment is still uh, looking uh, not very good. So I went back with a Scorflex 22515 at high pressure to prep the lesion a little bit better. And you can see that uh, I got quite a good uh, lumen gain. So this is quite a diffuse small vessel and as we have heard from the basket small two, this is a the largest RCT on small vessels. The use of DCB was non-inferior to DS up to 12 months, and the results is sustained up to three years. A very important sub-study for the basket small two is focusing on the diabetics. So what they found is that in patients with diabetes, if you use a DCB, the need for TBR is a lot lower when compared to a drug loading stent. So a good therapeutic option for my patient would be to use the solution uh, serolimus DCB. As we have heard, it is uh, using serolimus and the drug is re released up to 90 days and it has its unique CAT technology. So for the mid part of the RPDA, I use a solution 22525. One feature of the balloon that I really like, it is very deliverable. And for the proximal segment, I use a 2530. And that was the uh, final result, which I thought was quite acceptable. So one of the things that when we do DCB angioplasty is we worry about acute closure. So patient had a chest pain a few hours later with a bit of EKG change. We brought him back to the cath lab to have a relook. And you can see that the RPDA was widely patent. 
So I think if you do a good uh, angiographic final result with no low flow-limiting dissection, the uh, risk of acute closure is actually very low. And patient is clinically well on follow-up. So my take home message is uh, DCB angioplasty is safe and feasible in long diffuse CAD, as shown in my case. It's important to do the lesion preparation. You need to be a bit patient and do it well. Important to know your dissection grade, knowing which uh, lesion that you can leave alone and which one will require a bailout stenting. So the beauty of uh, DCB angioplasty is you are converting severe CAD into minor CAD and you leave uh, nothing behind. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we go to uh, another uh, case. This is the case of uh, uh, bifurcation uh, lesion. And Dr. Sudil Ratahore will uh, present this case. And we go the same presentation. We give a break on how we the treat and then uh, the treatment. Thank you, Antonio. So I will be presenting, uh, so continuing on the same theme, I will be presenting a complex uh, bifurcation case. So I've got no conflict of interest to declare. So my case is a 74-year-old gentleman, a male, who presented with severe chest pain for last uh, couple of hours, and he was brought to our accident and emergency department uh, with no previous history of known coronary artery disease. The background of smoker, he's a hypertensive, hyperlipidemia. He's had previous uh, CVA 10 years back and previous carotid artery stenosis. So his ECG, I will show you, showed inferior lateral ST depression with some ST elevation in the AVR lead. So he was uh, obviously treated, uh, considered as a primary PCI. So he was loaded with ticagrelor, 180 milligram and aspirin 300 milligram in the accident emergency department and was primary PCI was activated. So I'll just show you the ECG. This was the ECG for this gentleman. So you can see there's a widespread inferior lateral ST depression. There's some ST elevation in AVR lead. So he was brought to cath lab after preloading. Uh, so three hours history of chest pain. And this is his coronary angiogram. This is the right coronary artery. You can see the dominant vessel, got a diffuse uh, plaque disease, but nothing looks uh, significant. Then this was his uh, left coronary angiogram. As you can see, he's got a, he's got a severe left uh, main stem lesion, but you can't, what you can't appreciate here is that he's got a bifurcation, which uh, the left circumflex coronary artery is originating very acutely. Uh, like parallel to the LAD and then it turns at 90 degrees. So the angle of origin is very short. So we have to use, uh, put the wire in to just find out what's happening. So, so basically he had a left main lesion which extends into the proximal LAD and the proximal left circumflex coronary artery, which is a decent sized vessel. And I'll just stop here uh, to discuss uh, how we will proceed with this case. This, is, this was my discussion points for this case. Okay, uh, maybe can you, uh, while we discuss, can you just put on the screen uh, the angiogram so people uh, uh, make it run? First one. Okay. So any... Now, in this because it was a STEMI situation, so there is no imaging available for this case, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, it was clear to us that uh, it is a severe left main extending into the proximal AD and proximal circumflex. There's further disease you can see after the large uh, diagonal bifurcation, as well in the in the in the mid left anterior descending coronary artery, which is diffusely diseased up to the distal segment. Okay, so I think uh, no debate uh, is about treatment of the left main uh, uh, with a stent. I think uh, at this point. Uh, would yeah. you all agree that uh, no, I think uh, you need one stand, but you don't need more be, than that to yeah. help? So, uh, some uh, how would you treat besides the stenting of the left main that uh, most of us agree? I you know I see disease of the proximal circumflex is. Uh, I mean, this patient. Uh, uh, would be easily enrolled uh, in a randomized study of two stents versus one stent. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the guidelines uh, don't contradict uh, using DK crush uh, in the circumflex, which uh, despite the love for DK crush I have, I, I will try not to use it. <laughs> <coughs> and then there is uh, 
a long diffuse disease in the middle AD. I, I suspect that if you put a pressure wire there after having treated the left main, because you need to treat the left main first, I would not be surprised if the FFR is, uh, is abnormal. And do you think there is also, let's say, um, rationality to just uh, treat the left main, stand left main LAD, kiss to the circ, and then um, yeah, bring the patient back again with physiological assessment? Absolutely. I, I think uh, stenting the left main to optimize the left main stenting, uh, uh, do kissing, uh, maybe not uh, super aggressive kissing on the circumflex in order to avoid uh, dissection. Uh, and if you have, uh, I don't want to take away what you did. So maybe. I think the other who, reason. Uh, who to would put a stent uh, uh, as intention to treat uh, on the circumflex? Okay. Well, we are not following the guy. <laughs> <so. laughs> no, but I think. That, uh, don't you think that you the reason? Not, you no, not, no, definitely not. Do you think no. that the reason to avoid the circumflex uh, stenting would be that this is also an acute coronary syndrome, which uh, in this context has a more prothrombotic milieu? Um, no, not not necessarily. We, uh, if you do two stents well, they don't thrombose. Uh, if uh, if you do a good job. But uh, the fact that they don't thrombose doesn't mean that they don't reach the nose. And uh, you see, you see the movement of the circumflex in the RAO, co in the LAO caudal. And I think that movement is a kind of uh, antagonistic uh, to stenting. I agree. It might be even stent fracture predisposing uh, uh, mm -hmm. wrist stenosis <coughs> in the ostium of the... Because the wrist stenosis uh, yeah. on the Agreed. ostium of the circumflex uh, is... Uh, the well, only yeah. way to avoid the wrist stenosis on the ostium of the circumflex, I always tell, is not no, to do no, follow-up no. angiogram. Oh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, the problem is that sometimes the patient comes with chest pain, right? And yes, then you have yes, to do an but angiogram. <laughs> but you have to select the proper projection. Oh, yeah, there <laughs> is, uh, we, we have checked the biomarker. Uh, you think is important to check also the biomarker in these patients? Yes, Not we will. Uh, we've checked the biomarker, but this patient was uh, brought in as a hot case, uh, urgent. So the biomarkers were not available uh, when he came to the lab. But there was no doubt mm -hmm. it is acute coronary syndrome and yes. uh, and it's a thrombotic lesion. So biomarkers are important as well. So no, we, we checked, but it was not available at the time yeah. of the procedure. I don't know how that will affect uh, the strategy exactly. decision making. But with this acute uh, setup and uh, ST elevation in AVR, I think the simple thing will be to put a stent in the latement to LED and then pot and uh, definitely uh, provisional strategy is the best one yeah. because her complex uh, lesion, osteal lesion also okay. not very long. Uh, but what is a long osteal circumflex lesion? <laughs> Nobody knows. Five millimeters. So yesterday somebody said seven millimeter. So probably in acute setting, it will be a single sense strategy. Yeah. And I yeah. think we uh, all agree that in such a setting, we want to keep the procedure simple or as simple as possible and as safe as possible. And that there, are, I think everyone would go for a provisional yeah. strategy, yeah. leaving the options open. To what we do then, instead of going up front with the there's stand. there's one comment as well from yeah. Yeah, I yeah. I I think this was done. You go <laughs> continue. <laughs> <laughs> you stole the punchline. <laughs> Okay. Right, so I think uh, those are the options came to mind, uh, whether obviously the, the strategy, as Antonio mentioned. So I'll uh, just share, so, so how did I treat? So all those options come to your mind when you've got a left main bifurcation lesion, whether you adopt a provisional strategy or two-strand strategy upstream. 
Now, the provisional strategy doesn't mean that you can't put a two-strand strategy, but you have to do a crossover stenting. So what uh, uh, what I did, so this is, so we go, went through right radial artery. We used a seven French guiding catheter, a slender sheath, EBU 3.5 with wire in both arteries. And we aimed for a provisional left main uh, crossover stent into the LAD and then see how the side branch looks like. So we dilated with 3.550 non-compliant balloon. And you can see the balloon is fully inflated. And... Uh, and then we took a stent, uh, which was 3.5 by 22, Resolute Onyx. We inserted a crossover from left main ostium into the proximal LAD, into a good landing zone, followed by proxi uh, proximal optimization by a 4.5 by 8 non-compliant balloon, which is done here. And now the question comes, obviously, if you see, this is, this is the result after that. Uh, so that is where uh, the strategy has to be clear because there was a definitely because of the sh sharp acute angle into the circumflex and um, not clear how, how how much length is involved. So at this point, either you can leave it as it is, uh, the circumflex, it is TIMI 3 flow, residual stenosis is significant and it's extending few millimeters into the circumflex, or should we do anything about the side branch? Now, being a large side branch from the experience, our experience and from the historical experience from the randomized trials, if we leave them uh, significant stenosis in the side branch, there is a high, uh, uh, obviously TLR rate means uh, the, the symptomatic uh, restenosis uh, and symptoms are high. So as uh, most of you suggested, we recrossed into the side branch, as you can see here. And then what we did is uh, here, so we recrossed into the distal stand strut into the side branch, and then we opened up the side branch strut with a 2O semi-compliant balloon and made sure that the 2O semi-compliant balloon at the lowest possible pressure is fully dilated with no residual stenosis on the side branch. So I think the lesion preparation is very important and you don't want to dilate very aggressively to cause dissection in the side branch if you want to not put second uh, second stent here. And followed by, I treated the side branch with a 2.75 by 15 a solution SLR DCB at six atmospheric pressure when it was fully inflated for 60 seconds and followed by kissing balloon inflation. Now I used the same balloon in the side branch to use as one of the balloons and then took 3.5 by 15 non-compliant balloon for left main stem into LAD and we did a kissing balloon and this was uh, the this was the procedure done here, and this was uh, the post angiogram, uh, and then we did the report as suggested by uh, the bifurcation community. We used a 5.0 by 8 millimeter non-compliant balloon in the left main stem to do the report to make it more aligned. As you can see, so this achieved a pretty good result uh, for us in in both. Uh, LAD and uh, both the left main stem LAD and the side branch. And then as Antonio suggested, we did a FFR uh, for to assess the lesion in the mid LAD. We were planning, we will do the pressure wire now and bring uh, back the patient if mid LAD needs to be treated. But this was non-flow limiting. There was no significant, uh, as, as most of the people say that you do um, uh, after, after, so how do you assess the result of a uh, uh, kissing balloon angioplasty without a second stand? If there's no residual significant stenosis, TIMI flow is good and there's no flow limiting dissection, then you are good to go. And we have treated this with GP2B3 inhibitor as well. And this was the final result uh, of the patient. And then this was the ECG one day post uh, procedure and the patient went home uh, a couple of days later. So this was my procedure. Now, this procedure will look exactly the similar if I have not used a drug coated balloon. If I've just done the drug, uh, the, just a non-compliant balloon to the side branch kissing balloon, but the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So I uh, sometimes bring this patient back uh, after a few months to see how uh, the side branch uh, lesion is doing. It's not uh, clinically, uh, clinically related, but uh, the patient came back for further assessment. We're more interested in the LAD. So we've got a angiogram to share, uh, which we did in six months time, a follow up angiogram. So the result is still holding, as you can see the side branch and the left main and the LAD and the mid LAD lesion looks exactly the similar. And we did uh, again, the pressure wire IFR was done, which looks 0 0.92 and patient remains asymptomatic with no angina. So we have left uh, it, uh, we have deferred the procedure. So my take home message is that the bifurcation with large side branch, mainly in the left main setting and the large uh, when it's 2.5 or more are common. And study, the historical studies have shown that side branch restenosis at the ostium with provisional stenting is high with high MACE events and also even with two stent strategies in these case. 
एस एल आर और ड्रग कोटर बलून है फीजेबिलिटी एंड इम्प्रूव आउटकम्स इन स्मॉल वेसल आई एस आर एंड साइड ब्रांच लीजेंस एंड दिस इज अ नोवल टेक्नोलॉजी फॉर पोटेंशियली इम्प्रूव आउटकम्स इन कॉम्प्लेक्स बाइफरकेशन लीजेंस विद यूज आदर एज अ प्राइमरी और एज अ हाइब्रिड अप्रोच एज आई यूज इन माई केस Now, provisional main vessel stenting and as a DCB to side branch effective treatment strategy for simplicity and better outcomes. Because most of the operators will do a kissing balloon uh, here in this case, and if the kissing balloon alone is done, there will be very high risk of uh, restenosis at the side branch. And if it is a large side branch, I think the alternative option is to use drug coated balloon to the side branch as a hybrid, and it could be safely crossed. Uh, in my experience, I've been using it for. Uh, Uh, last uh, couple of years uh, and for last 12 months with this uh, technology i have not had any problem with delivering uh, the drug coated balloon through the stent strut after opening up the stent struts and uh, using it after the main vessel stenting uh, and uh, we probably probably need randomized trials with side uh, branch drug coated balloon in large side branch mainly in the left main setting compared to either provisional or two stent strategies uh, going forward Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. May I ask one question? Yeah. So I um I'm interested in the position of the kissing balloons because you kissed with the dab um uh, and so um how far do you go back into the left main do you try to snuggle so that the drug eluding balloon stays exactly in the circumflex and you don't get the double drug dose with the stent in the left main uh, what's your strategy? Yeah so th- those are the valid points and we also thought about there is no bench study done to see but there was a small study uh, done to see that the the one issue is the crossing of drug coated balloon through the stent so whether it can shear off some of the drugs or the thing on the balloon but they have shown that there is no shearing off of the drug when you cross through the stent strut if the drug uh, stent struts are well open before and when we put drug coated balloon we try to put the dot into the main vessel so we keep minimum possible protrusion into the left main stem when we put uh, the drug coated balloon for 60 seconds and once it is done then we pull back the balloon about half a length and then do the kissing balloon i have been doing it with the with the same balloon obviously uh, just for the simple reason that we don't want to cause any dissection at the ostium and we don't want to keep it uh, undilated uh, and uh, we have not had any any major problems so far okay so Yeah, if there are not other commands we will go further with Antonio Columbus uh, talk and his takeaway messages uh, which we are looking for. Thank you Antonio. So I think uh, uh you heard most uh, of the strategy that has been suggested i try to summarize and uh, uh, this is an old slide that i keep on presenting but this is a, a, a bioresolvable scaffold but uh, this illustrates the concept of positive remodeling and can only be achieved if uh, you don't have a permanent device and uh, besides the bioresorbable scaffold the drug coated balloon are such a device you see the mean lumen uh, post index procedure was 4.9 and after 32 months uh, became 7.3 and this positive remodeling is not a constant event even with drug coated balloon it may occur maybe 30 to 40% of the times but with the stents it occurs 0% of the time and this is also the pulsatility so uh, why we can afford not to implanting a stent in every lesion uh, we couldn't say this 5 uh, years ago Now we have tools to obtain optimal lesion dilatation, rotablation, orbital atherectomy, lithotripsy, laser with contrast, cutting a scoring balloon, very high pressure balloon. We can really get, I don't think lesion preparation, lesion dilatation, because we we basically uh, preparation it means to implant a stent. Uh, so we can really. Uh, do something that a uh, few years ago was not uh, so easy to be done uh, 
uh, we have imaging uh, and uh, uh, physiologic tool to evaluate the result, uh, not only in geography. And uh, I think uh, the term dissection uh, is a yes and no terminology. I, if you go back to the old classification, there is a type of dissection, type A, B, and etc. So a very tiny extraluminal dissection is uh, tolerated and sometimes is what you need to achieve in order to dilate the lesion. So I don't think uh, uh, we should be afraid if you see some uh, dissection of the vessel. In addition, we have optimal antiplatelet therapy, we have dual antiplatelet therapy. So we have a, a way to do better angioplasty. Unfortunately, uh, many young interventionists have never been trained to do angioplasty. They only trained to do stent implantation. As a matter of fact, they say, I failed to implant a stent. <laughs> A key element in this strategy is to limit stent length, is to tolerate a dissection. I mean, tolerate doesn't mean uh, not to treat a dissection when it needs to be treated, but to be uh, not uh, dogmatic and treat uh, with a stent any type of uh, uh, dye staining that looks a dissection. In the old time, this is a paper we published in Jack in 2015 about spot stenting. And we did a lot of spot stenting. Uh, unfortunately, many people contradicted us and, and told us that you should stent every spot. But uh, at that time, a dissection was not stenting if the IVUS measurement of the true lumen at the dissection site was at least 50% of the vessel cross-sectional area or the minimal lumen cross-sectional area was 70 to 80% of the vessel cross-sectional area. And we really did not have uh, uh, occlusions and uh, uh, we were working uh, with uh, thick strut stents, not uh, uh, very new stents. These are the type of dissections that I believe uh, you should not tolerate you see on the left side there is an LED with dissection. As a matter of fact, a physiologic assessment shows that these dissections are not uh, are flow limiting. But uh, with uh, further balloon dilatation, you don't uh, tackle the dissection. It's very difficult to tackle the dissection. Uh, the, um, Sometimes it happens, but what you do is first a balloon dilatation, you make the true lumen larger and the dissection gets smaller as far as occupying the vessel architecture. And as a matter of fact, the physiologic assessment becomes more benign with an FFR of 87. And this is a uh, the immediate result uh, in two projections, and this is a follow-up after one year. Uh, this is, uh, we, of course, we did a drug-coated balloon after uh, lesion preparation, but uh, it's really pleasing when you see this anatomy preserved. Uh, and, of course, uh, one image is not sufficient, but uh, I hope next year we will be able to present data. Uh, I think I already showed this slide many times, but... Uh, uh, Dr. Leone will present, uh, I believe, tomorrow uh, these uh, data. And uh, we did the uh, complex lesions, 80% uh, LED with uh, uh, various uh, uh, devices, I mean, 6% uh, almost rotablation. So we are not dealing uh, with a straightforward uh, simple lesion, the shock wave uh, uh, 5.8. Uh, we had to do bailout stenting in about 5% of the cases, uh, and in 10, 11%, we did uh, some kind of stenting uh, associated. We used uh, various uh, uh, devices uh, as far as drug coat balloons, uh, and we measured uh, PDPA. Why we measure PDPA? Because almost all of this lesion had a dissection. So uh, we wanted to be absolutely confident that we were not putting this patient in danger. And this is after lesion preparation of DCB. We don't know what is a magic PDPA number. Uh, we assume that it's about 10, but uh, we need uh, uh, some uh, IBUS guided study. So to summarize, this is my last slides, uh, how to prepare a lesion before a DCB. 
predilect and predilect the legion as you plan to stand. Uh, some people are more conservative, and I don't know if the strategy that I propose is the right one. Uh, this is the strategy we utilize. Uh, we do optimal legion preparation. Then we do angiography. If the angiography gives, shows a good result, we go for DCB and we don't waste time. If you have a questionable result, we evaluate the lesion with whatever device you have. You, if you like IVUS, you do IVUS, OCT, FFR, PDA. Uh, if uh, the uh, lesion evaluation tells you that it's just an angiographic uh, uh, turmoil, but the lumen is okay, you do DCB. If the uh, non, non angio evaluation tells you there's there something not acceptable, you do another dilatation, most of the time with a bigger balloon, uh, because uh, whatever happens, you always have a stent in your laboratory. If after the second dilatation, the situation improves, you do DCB, otherwise you implant a stent. With this strategy, we end up implanting a stand maybe 10, 15 percent of the time. Uh, we try not to use at this moment this strategy when you are dealing with a short lesion located in a 3.5 vessel. I think uh, at this moment we are still a little bit conservative in that respect. Thank you for your attention. So uh, one, one important question, Antonio, is, um, which means the strategy is almost based on the, let's say, also primary result after angioplasty when you have uh, any kind of recoil. You don't believe that uh, um, there can be a positive remod remodeling future as well? Or because you said whenever there is after the primary angioplasty, you see that there is a residual stenosis, there's, it's not the optimal let's say, primary result on imaging. How do you define it? Uh, the, uh, in imaging, uh, we need uh, uh, a lumen, which uh, is, uh, as I said, at least 70% of the cross-sectional area of the balloon we utilize. Uh, if you use uh, a three millimeter balloon, that is a common balloon, uh, you expect a cross-sectional area if the balloon uh, does a stent implantation of about 7.58. Uh, uh, we uh, like to have a lumen cross-section of uh, about 5.5. Uh, 5. So okay. it's about uh, 60, 70 percent. If there is a dissection, uh, the presence of a dissection is tolerable if uh, the true lumen cross-sectional area is large enough. Because uh, it's like... Uh, Uh, competing uh, uh, forces, the dissection will be uh, too weak to compete with the true lumen, which is large enough. Mm -hmm. And with time, the true lumen will win over the dissection. Uh, this is something that I did in the last 40 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just a brief question, Antonio. So those patients where you have dissection after the procedure is finished, How many percentage uh, may have to come back to the left due to acute closure oh, after no, the procedure no. is done? I'm sorry to say, because I almost never say that, but so far, nobody. It's a, so that's an important a, point And as well, the yes. other point I encourage, if you have a, a, some dissection, do not keep on injecting yes. dye, <laughs> especially now with the power injector, You need a weak assistant. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, one, one very, very last yeah. question because we're out of time. Uh, two two points. One is uh, when I'm uh, inflating a long drug eluting balloon, we go uh, slowly. I mean, I glow slowly till six or eight is being achieved. Now, you count 60 seconds from that point of time or starting from the inflation? Oh, I'm, I'm not so rigid about time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can extend it up to 90 seconds I, or something. I, I like stay... That. And, and I, the second question is, uh, how much time you should wait after taking out the wear to check finally that... That's a very important. Sometimes, uh, if, uh, if I have to do two lesions, I predilate the LED 
I do everything. I leave the wire on the LED. I don't use drag eluting balloon on the LED. I do my job on the circumflex. So I wait 20 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe I place a stent on the circumflex because every patient wants at least one stent. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, in that period of time, I check uh, if the LED has recoil. If uh, in 10, 15 minutes the LED has recoil, maybe it's no good, I dilate more, I do something more. But if the LED has no recoil, and sometimes I leave a pressure wire in the LED, and it's amazing that I see at the end of the procedure, the PDPA is 91, 92, after 10, 15 minutes becomes 95, 96. Antonio, what you're saying actually is that the flow is the most important, right? Because yeah, you use anatomy, exactly. but it's the flow, forward flow, that will also keep the dissection open, right? And uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, I do a lot of procedure with the pressure wire, uh, also to understand myself. And uh, uh, as soon as I finish the dilatation, the PDPA is uh, 91, 89. And then I wait... Uh, uh, two or three minutes uh, and goes up. And this, uh, to me, is the most important element. If it goes up, it's good. If it goes down, don't you do another dilatation or stent. Very interesting. Okay. Very interesting. Yeah. So I think we could uh, discuss okay. uh, uh, for, 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 for hours. <laughs> Thank you but very much. All for, anecdotal, yeah, please. Yeah, don't yeah. Take Thank it. you very much. It was a great no, session. Thanks, Antonio. Okay.